Amen. Acts 1, 6 through 8. And when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be my witnesses, you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Today we're talking about the disciples. We've been discussing the series Faith in Uncertain Times and and what we have been talking about is overcoming fear and and striking out fear and 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 having faith in uncertain times. Part 1 of our series discuss Job and how we are able to see God in a different lens and in a different light as a result of trial and tribulation. And then we talked about Daniel and how Daniel was able to navigate uh, various uh, levels of either prosperity or persecution while in exile because he purposed in his heart that he would not compromise his conviction and his faithfulness toward God. Uh, we also talked about last week Abraham as the father of faith and how Abraham set the precedent by which we are able to have faith because uh, he had uncertainty in where God was taking him in Canaan and he had uncertainty in, in his uh, the, the future of his offspring and there was so much uncertainty and while Abraham did not have a precedent such as a Bible, such as a scripture and such as a rich uh, history of heritage. Uh, he set a precedent for us that we can look to uh, in having faith in uncertain times. And we went as far back as Job and as far back as Daniel and as far back as Abraham, but we can bring it a little closer to home, even though it's still thousands of years ago. But now we are looking at the disciples and at this point, Jesus had already died, Jesus had already resurrected, and Jesus is about to ascend to heaven. And he tells them prior to the text that they should go to Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit. And so as they're having this conversation, they ask him the question in the text. Now, before we revisit the text, let's talk about uh, the disciples here. Number one, we know that the disciples were a motley crew of individuals. The, they were all Jews. That was their common heritage. Yet they were they existed of a variety of different characters and personalities. We have uh, a group of fishermen by way of Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and uh, and. And, and you also have uh, the tax collector, Matthew. And as a matter of fact, Matthew wasn't the only tax collector because in Matthew 9 and 9, he invites Jesus over to his house with a bunch of his tax collector friends, along with other uh, what could be translated as disreputable sinners in, in Matthew 9 and 10. And, and we see that while the immediate 12 uh, consisted of who we know as the 12 disciples, Jesus called additional disciples uh, uh, upwards of 70 plus that consisted of many uh, varying personality, many varying characters. And, and, and these many of these characters didn't hold always hold the same mindset and throughout his ministry, uh, Jesus had to challenge them in a variety of ways. He had to challenge their perspective in a variety of ways. And uh, during his ministry, he had to uh, challenge varying views because at this point, during this point, they were carrying with them varying traditions that had come about over the years. He had to challenge ideas about race in class when he tells the story of the Good Samaritan. He had to challenge perspectives of self-righteousness when uh, the, the parents of James and John said, can you set one on your left hand and one on your right hand? And they had this idea that, well, when, when you set up your kingdom, we, you know, we've been right here by you. Can you just set one on your left and one on your right? And Jesus tells them, you, you, you really don't know what you're asking for, because in order for you to be where I am, you have to go through what I'm getting ready to go through and you're not ready to 
drink of that cup. And he had to challenge their belief. I mean, they had seen Jesus performed many miracles and they had seen Jesus do many miraculous things and, and yet they feared when they were on a boat suffering uh, through a hurricane and he challenged their unbelief. And so you had such a, a motley crew of individuals who had been walking with Jesus and through this relationship, he had to challenge so many things with them. And so what we have here is a group of people that had been through it with Jesus. Over the past three years, they had seen Jesus do a lot of things. They had been through a lot of things. They had been challenged in, in varying ways. And at this point, they, they felt comfortable enough to ask Jesus the question, okay, okay, now is it time for Israel to be restored, for the kingdom to be restored to Israel? Because in addition to all of the other things that they had perceived, they also felt like Jesus was going to be the, not only the uh, internal savior, but the external savior. Because all throughout the Old Testament, they knew the prophecies and they, they knew what the prophecies were saying. And they were expecting Jesus to be the military leader to overthrow the Roman government that they were under. They were looking for a David type uh, military savior. They were looking for something similar to a judge that would come in and, 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 and take on a governmental overthrow of Rome so that the kingdom but we, but would be restored back to Israel so that Israel would once again be autonomous, that Israel would once again be self-governing, that it's a, so that Israel would once again be on its own. And so they were listening to Jesus and Jesus told them that they needed to go to Jerusalem and await the Holy Spirit. And so in recognizing this, they understood that Jesus was preparing them for the fulfillment of Joel 2.28. What does Joel 2.28 say? Joel 2.28 says that in that time, the spirit will fall upon all men, upon men and women and children and all generations, young and old. The, the young men uh, will prophesy. The old men will see visions and, and uh, all the generations would see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And then the, the, the scripture also goes on to talk about how God will establish his kingdom. And so what the disciples are asking is, well, if you're going to send the Holy Spirit, are you also going to return the kingdom to Israel? Are both of these things going to happen at the same time? This is the question here. In, in, in sending your Holy Spirit, now I get it, I get it. You, you came to bring about internal salvation, but are you still going to establish your governmental kingdom on this earth? Are you going to get us out from under the thumb, under the foot, under the, the, the burden of Roman rule? Are you going to do that too? See, they also understood where the prophecy was coming from. Now, the disciples question reflects what they wanted, that they wanted the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the overthrow of Rome to happen simultaneously. So while they were happy and expectant about one thing, they still wanted the other thing. Now, Jesus reveals that the establishment of God's permanent kingdom was already set and it was not for them to know. In other words, he didn't say no, but he said, no, he said, don't worry about that right now. <laughs> he, essentially, he's saying that's not for you to be concerned about. That's not for your immediate concern. God has got that under control. Here's what I need you to do. I need you to worry about going to Jerusalem, waiting for the Holy Spirit, because when the Holy Spirit comes, you're going to receive power to be my witnesses. That's what you do know, and that's what you ought to be concerned about. What, I, what God is going to do in his time is his concern. And so what we see here is while the disciples uh, rightfully considered what would happen. They wanted it, what they really wanted to happen, they wanted it to happen immediately. They wanted the kingdom to be returned to Israel right now. 
They had waited so long and the, and, and the Messiah, they, the, the Messiah was right in front of them. The, the, the prophecy was right before them. And so what they wanted to happen, they wanted it to happen right now. And this is the world that we live in. We live in a world of instant gratification, immediate gratification. Now, instant gratification is the desire to experience pleasure or fulfillment without delay or deferment. Basically, it's you want what you want and you want it now. Now, suffice it to say, Israel had been waiting a long time for this type of deliverance. And so it was okay for them to wonder if it was going to happen right now. And, and this is the, the and, and increasingly as we go in, in, into so much modernization in this life, we become less and less patient because we have become accustomed to instant outcomes. We become so accustomed to instant outcomes. If you don't feel like cooking, you got a microwave. Sometimes if you, if you look at DoorDash or you look at something that says it's going to take 40 to 50 minutes to get to your house, that's just too long. I can zap something in 60 minutes. I can throw it in the air fryer. Air fryer is one of my favorite things right now. I love my air fryer. I can take that. Well, something that takes a, a, an hour to do in the oven, I can knock out in 15 minutes in the air fryer. And if I don't feel like waiting for the air fryer, if it takes 15 minutes in the air fryer, I can knock it out in two minutes in the microwave. We, we have become so impatient. What about social media? You post something on social media thinking it's going to be a hit. And what do you do? Immediately you start, how, how many likes am I going to get? How many comments are going to, and it's taking too long. Somebody hadn't said something in an hour. Well, I guess it wasn't good enough. We're looking to be fed instantly. Online shopping. Boy, if you want it, we, we don't even go to Walmart no more. We don't go to, well, my wife goes to Target, but uh, uh, we, we don't go to these places anymore because we know Amazon is going to have what we have. And, and if you got Prime, you can get it in two days. Yeah, I mean, as soon as you get that uh, uh, that verification that your order is going through, what's the first thing you do? You check the tracking number. Has it shipped yet? You just pay for it. You just, but now you're already checking. Is it on the way? Where is it? Is it on the, the next Amazon truck that rides by your house? You think it's for you. We want instant gratification. And, and, and listen, if nothing has tested our patience is this pandemic, because all we've been doing during quarantine is streaming movies, streaming television shows, and we never realized how terrible our internet was. And still we wanted to see that show and it started buffering. And you saw that little circle going, oh, this it's taking too long. Why? Because we want instant gratification. We want everything to happen and we want it to happen now. It's taking too long. We've waited long enough. And to be more serious about it, I know I've been in joking about microwaves and social media, but even in our current society, we want justice. We see racial injustice. We see gender injustice. We see all of these things happening and, and we get dissatisfied when we don't see the justice system work as fast and as efficient as we think it ought to be. Why don't they just write a law? Why don't they just pass an executive order? Why don't they just do that? And if it's not happening fast enough, we try to do it ourselves. Yes, absolutely. We should we should march and we should speak out and we should say something. And, and, and but we're expecting the government to solve the problem with the stroke of a pen. We're expecting our legislators to legislate deliverance, to legislate things. And, and, and what we found out through history is that sometimes quickly legislating something may solve one problem, but create another. My wife and I were watching a documentary on Netflix called Crack. And it was talking about the war on drugs. And one of the people that were a part of this legislation, this the, 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 the laws that were passed to uh, legislate and, and add penalties to the crack epidemic in the United States back in the 80s, they, they passed a law that would uh, p uh, pass punishment on possession of a certain amount of crack. And then a, a, a legislation that uh, made, per, uh, excuse me, uh, 
um, punishment on a certain amount of cocaine. And what they said was they didn't realize the difference between crack and cocaine. And by passing the legislation about the different types of punishment on a certain amount of crack and a certain amount of cocaine, they didn't even realize what they were doing, but they knew they had to do something. And by doing something, they felt like they were solving a problem and they didn't realize that they were creating another problem because they were putting people in jail for a, 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 a small amount, the same degree that we're having for somebody else who would have a whole amount of crack versus cocaine. I forget what the, the numbers were. And so what he was saying was, we didn't know what we were doing. We just knew we had to do something. And that's what we feel like today. We just need justice. We don't care what it is. We don't care what it looks like. We just feel like we need to do something. And we're not willing to wait for it to bake a little longer in the oven. We're not willing to wait for it to be uh, fleshed out in order for it to be done the right way. We just want justice now. And, and yes, we ought to cry out for justice. And yes, we ought to do it. But let, let, me, say, let me say this to you, that ultimately justice and and the establishment of God's permanent kingdom and permanent deliverance will not be found in the halls of Congress. If you thought that the election was going to solve a problem, then you're wrong. If you thought that the next four years were going to be peachy keen because you voted your man in and voted the other man out, then I'm, you're sadly mistaken because that is what the disciples were looking for. The disciples were looking for deliverance for Israel. But Jesus was saying, the kingdom that I'm going to establish is greater than that. And so I've got that under control. What I need you to do is witness under the power of the Holy Spirit. And so what am I saying to you? What I'm saying is God's justice is coming. God's kingdom is coming. We've got to be willing to wait for it. We've got to be willing to hope for it. We've got to know that all that we see going on, and, and while we're working for justice here on earth, while we're working for justice here in the United States, while we're looking for all of these things to happen, at the end of the day, we know that as, as men and women of God, as Christians, we win at the end. We don't know how long it's going to take. We don't know what it's going to look like. Like, but we do know that we win. I've read the story. I've read the Bible. I've read the prophecy. Saints, we win. We might not see it in front of us. We might not feel it right now, but just wait and be patient because we win. And while it's okay and right to expect certain outcomes, we you shouldn't always expect them immediately. Now, using Jesus instructions to disciples, while we wait for what we want, we must work with what we have. I'm going to say that again. While we wait for what we want, the establishment of his kingdom, while we wait for what we want, the establishment of his ultimate justice. While we wait for what we want, we need to work with what we have. In this context, what is it that we have? We have the power of his Holy Spirit to witness. <clears throat> So what is he saying here? He's not saying wait for the kingdom and that's going to solve all your governmental problems. He's, while you're waiting for my kingdom to be established, you need to do some work. What is the work that you need to do? Go to Jerusalem. Wait for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you and you will have power. Power to do what? Be my witnesses. Telling everybody about me into Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. What does that mean for you? Your house, your community, your church. You need to take what you have and that is the power of the Holy Spirit to prepare mankind for the establishment of God's permanent kingdom. For you need to preach the gospel under the power of the Holy Spirit while we are waiting for his kingdom, while we are waiting for him to establish his kingdom. And it's bigger than just Israel. It's bigger than just your city. It's bigger than just the United States. It's bigger than your limited perspective. What God is about to do, he's about to do for the whole earth. And your responsibility is under the power of the Holy Spirit. Get them ready for what God is going to establish. 
And so while we're waiting, we must trust God for what he has promised to do, even though we don't exactly know what, how, and when. And, and while we trust and wait, we must witness. We can't twiddle our thumbs expecting the government to solve all the problems. As we have seen, we can't even trust the government sometimes. As we have seen, while we're looking for justice, sometimes the justice system don't work. And so our responsibility is to pray and witness according to the word of God and do what the word of God tells us to do. Because a lot of the issues that we are dealing with in a governmental level come from the root of sin. Well, whose responsibility is it to deal with sin? It is the men and women of God preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. The government can't legislate a sin problem. The government can't write a, an executive order that solves a sin problem problem. They can legislate it, but they can't deliver us from it. And so what we've got to do is be witnesses under the power of the Holy Spirit to change the hearts of men and women. Because if you change the heart, then legislation can't even do anything about it. Change man's heart through the power of the Holy Spirit while we wait for God to establish his kingdom. We don't know when, we don't know how, we don't know where, but we know what we have and that is the Holy Spirit. While we wait. Speaking of Rome, Paul tells the church at Rome in Romans 8, 23 through 25, and not only the creation, we see all of the creation crying and worrying about what's happening to this generation and what's going to happen. But not only the creation, but we ourselves talking about the Christian who have the first fruits of the spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we will wait for it with patience. We don't see what God is going to do, but we know he's going to do it. We don't see how he's going to do it, we don't, we just know that he's going to do it. We don't know when he's going to do it, but we know that he's going to do it. But what we do know is that the inward redemption that we have in the Holy Spirit is the first fruit of the outward redemption that he is going to establish in the earth. And so the way you've been set free internally, we know that he's going to set us free externally in the right time, in the right moment, in the right place, under the right circumstance. We know that he's going to do it. And so if you have felt his deliverance inwardly, you know that he's going to do it outwardly. The first fruit of the Holy Spirit allows us to be able to share the gospel so that when he establishes the entire harvest of his kingdom, we have experienced the first fruit of his Holy Spirit. So what we do have outwardly is the first fruit of what we, excuse me, what we do have inwardly is the first fruit of what we will have outwardly. Our spiritual redemption gives hope and patience for a physical redemption. We must concentrate on serving him and his, as his witnesses and trusting God, God's means of deliverance, God's means of justice will ultimately prevail. And so know this, things will not always happen immediately. S problems will never be solved immediately. And if they are, then they may not always be solved the way you want them to. See, the benefit of waiting sometimes outweighs the convenience of immediate gratification. And so what we ought to do is while we're waiting for God to establish his ultimate deliverance, is under the power of the Holy Spirit, serve him. Under the power of his Holy Spirit, be his witnesses. Under the power of his spirit, and that first fruit of his spirit gives us the hope for what we don't see. Gives us the patience of what we don't see. It's not for us to know the time and the seasons, but what we do know is that we have the Holy Spirit in us, Reverend Wiley, this for you, in us and around us to be with us as we serve as his witnesses in the name of Jesus. The doors of the church are open at this time as we prepare 
to surrender ourselves to the Lord.